Where's the kaboom? There was supposed to be an earth-shattering kaboom. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and are you the member of a banking fortune dynasty? If so, call me. If not, keep listening, because today we welcome an expert in creating your own generational wealth, Candy Valentino. For our TikTok Minute, we'll have a kid with a great accent dropping some serious knowledge bombs. In our headlines, layoffs are all over the headlines, but what if you need a new job? We'll have advice. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Nick, who's saving 40% on his active duty pay, but trying to plan for a pay cut. And then, I'll share some trivia about a family we probably all wish we were a part of. And now, two guys who are like your money papas. I don't like the sound of that. It's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. I don't know, Doug. There's brands all over the internet. Money saving mama. Money mama. How come we can't be the money papas? It does sound a little, uh, does sound a little mafia, doesn't it? Because I feel like you're going to ask me to call you daddy at some point, and I don't... <laughs> May do that now. I'm not going Maybe. there, man. Let's see what happens. Who knows? Hey, everybody. Welcome to You Don't Need Cool Jazz to Get the Love Flowing Podcast. I'm Joe Salsi. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. <laughs> welcome to another Monday of the Stacky Benjamin Show. You can hear from my voice that I'm uh, feeling a million percent today. Just incredible. How this uh, still? thing attacks the vocal cords. Still? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's great. I know. Feeling like 50 bucks? I actually, you know what's funny? Today's the first day I can say I probably feel better than I sound. But let's introduce our crew here. First of all, <laughs> the guy who's long hot dogs, but probably short the relish. It's Mr. OG. You're not a big fan of relish on the hot dog, are you? No way. Yeah, see? I, I don't even like hot dogs it. that much. I nailed it. Oh, come on. Hot dogs? can do a summer hot dog at the pool, throw them on the grill type of thing. But for just about like any other reason. You like a little char reason. on the dog? What's that? You like a little char on there? It doesn't bother me. Yeah. Oh, see, I prefer it. I, th- it just, I think it adds. I don't want it burned, but I want definitely be able to taste the char. And mustard only. There is only one way. Yeah, ketchup, to- mustard, onions, pickles. The thing that I, uh, I, I used to get them at Costco, but they stopped the little onion machine at Costco, you know, where you could like crank your oh, own onion out. Loved, oh. loved it. Fabulous. There was more onion than than dog. Yeah, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah that was good. Yes. That so. other voice you're hearing, you heard it at the beginning. The guy who lost my mom's audio book, so now we'll never hear the end of it. It's neighbor Doug. You were looking for that, like you thought of that joke a couple of days ago, and you're like, how do I slip that? I thought in? of it like four seconds ago. It just came to me. Uh-huh. It was pretty amazing. How yeah. are you, man? I'm fantastic. I probably played over the weekend, probably played at being horizontal on the couch. Oh, fabulous. Yes. That's a great way to spend a weekend. But you know what? It's Monday, so. Wild card weekend. Yes, absolutely. Too bad the Lions didn't make it, but they showed the Packers. They showed the Packers. More importantly, they showed Aaron Rodgers. That was a good end. <laughs> absolutely. Much, much I mean, that's a week ago now, but. Yes, agreed. Good and, and here comes all the Wisconsin hate mail. Sorry, guys. Sorry. As if we didn't get enough of those <laughs> when uh, Brian from Wisconsin called in. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. Please, let's re-forget about that. Candy Valentino is here today. She is an amazing force of nature. And uh, if you've never heard Candy talk, Candy's going to help us build intergenerational wealth on this important holiday Of course, it's MLK Junior Day here in the USA. We're here in the basement because, of course, there are no holidays in the basement. We're here December 25th. There's no days off for your money. No, absolutely not. (laughs) Candy Valentino here today, (laughs) hanging out with us. Big headlines. TikTok Minute. Let's get moving. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes to us from the Wall Street Journal. This is written by Justin Lahart. We've heard a lot uh, lately about all the companies doing layoffs. I feel like every time I watch the news, I read anything. Oh, gee, 
I hear about uh, layoffs. Companies are gritting their teeth and, wait for it, hiring. Justin writes, a lot of businesses are feeling morose about where the economy is heading, and yet they still are looking to hire more workers. The Labor Department two weeks ago reported there were a seasonally adjusted 10.5 million unfilled job openings in the U.S. as of the last day of November, about equal to the upwardly revised count for October. That was down from the extremes hit earlier this year, but still far above anything seen during the pre-pandemic period. Seems, OG, that uh, this economy being on life support um, might be a little overrated and people are out there getting new jobs. Sure does seem like it's who you ask, right? I mean, if you're looking at any major tech company, it seems like they're all laying off tens of thousands of people on a pretty regular basis here. Uh, I did read something the other day that said that maybe it's just going to affect the upper white collar workers as opposed to where recessions usually land, which is solidly in the middle class. Maybe that's going to be the the impact this time. But it's not really a good thing because we want the economy to slow down. Otherwise, and that's why, you know, the market is still kind of all over the place is because everything they're doing to try to slow the economy down is not having the exact effect that the Federal Reserve wants to have immediately. So keep raising rates to make it a little bit more challenging to borrow money, slows growth. Hopefully inflation goes down. If you're somebody who is uh, worried about losing your job, though, I think this is great news that uh, keeping that resume up to date, getting your LinkedIn profile in place, making sure that, you know, we talked last week about your incoming uh, message on your iPhone. Like, yeah. let's get everything tight. Make yourself ready, because even if layoffs are coming, it's a good reminder. It's almost like when interest rates started going up and we said, hey, time to get your debt strategy in place, right? I feel like now we're ringing the bell saying this is the time to make sure that 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 you're you're hireable, that you are ready to go, because if the economy does slow down, well, that's bad news. Maybe you do lose your job and you're going to be fighting for a new one becomes the amazing race to get the next job. Or on the other side, listen to this. This comes to us from a website called Just the News. Move over weight loss. Finding a new job gains steam as a New Year's resolution. I just saw this this last week. Millions of Americans, it seem, also plan on securing a new job over the next 12 months. A survey conducted by market research company OnePoll, a quarter of Americans are looking to try to find themselves a new job in 2023. One out of four of us say, hey, I'm going to be looking for a new job next year. I think it's just uh, time for a move for a lot of people, or do you think it's uh, money related? I don't know. That, that's a big number. That's a huge number. I'm wondering how accurate that survey is. One out of four. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd be interested. It, it, I think there's a lot of, depending on the context of that survey, I think there's a lot of people who are like, yeah, might as well. I'm not super happy where I am. But, you know, I don't, I don't know how many of those are actually going to follow through with it and look for a new job. I don't know how motivated they are. So I'm, I question that's a giant number in any survey. Heck, asking what your favorite candy bar is, you're not going to get one in four people to pick one. I agree with that, but that also talks about, Doug, to the point that maybe we do need to look for a new job. You know, so many people go, oh, I'll, I'll sit here another year, and then we waste our life. I mean, we just waste time at this dead-end thing that we don't really love. Just a, just a horrible place to be. In fact, to your point, this survey was only of 2,000 people. One-third of people said they were likely to look for a new job within the same sector. and Roughly a quarter of respondents, however said they were looking for a complete change of career. Do something different. Writer and researcher Chris Malore said the average American is, quote, willing to put themselves through two years of education to make a career switch, with 24% of respondents saying they'd be willing to spend more than three years improving their skills. Have you guys known people to completely change careers? I can think of one person that I know of who was going this direction and then went, yeah, I'm going this direction now. Change jobs, yeah. Change careers, though. Right. That's what had me thinking, OG, when you said that, because I know you know, several people who changed, who never really had a career, some sort of entrenched path that they were on for some established number of years and then said, I'm going to go be a horse whisperer now or something like that. Yeah. I haven't seen that before. 
so yeah, it's not as common as we seem to read about all the time in advice columns. But if you're going to do it, I think the time to do it is sooner rather than later. Malor says many of those wanting to switch careers are concerned about having to start all over again and accept an entry level position. So yeah, but I think, OG, the quicker you get that entry level position rolling, the quicker you're on your way to something that maybe makes you happier. Well, and that entry level, you know, may only happen for a sh- short period of time too, because while you may be new at that career, you still have a broader breadth of knowledge. If you're kind of mid career changing, you know, you can leverage. So do what makes you happy. It is definitely time though to, uh, Either way, this trend continues, I think, keeping the uh, LinkedIn profile up to date, making sure that you're hireable is uh, super important. I I got some great advice early in my career, which is always be working on every project you do. Think about how does this help my resume? Because then, OG, you're always thinking about career advancement. You're thinking about stuff that excites you, about making big moves instead of these little, little tiny moves. Time for our TikTok minute, time when we shine the light on a TikTok creator who's either doing something brilliant or hashtag brilliant. Oh, gee, I think this is the week. Doug nailed it last week on Wednesday. It was brilliant. Somebody saying stuff that was actually brilliant. Is this week going to be more brilliant? Uh, well, my, my thing is always uh, TikTok is the devil and everything that comes from it is evil. So I'm going to say that it is a uh, terrible advice, like always. Well, here we go. From the mouths of young people, listen to this advice from uh, from a kid who may be, I don't know, I'm thinking uh, eight or nine years old. Is it okay for people to stop working if they don't like their job? I'm going to say this in a philosophical way. Okay. So get prepared for some major juju, because it's going to go on for basically an hour. Okay. Okay. <laughs> get prepared for some major juju. A job, not only harvests money from your toil it also gives you a sense of good feeling what would you rather have the money but the dread of waking up on the morrow and having to face your crippling job wow yeah do you know what i love most about that what the phrase on the morrow <laughs> and I like that too. I picked that too. I picked that up too right away. I thought, did that kid just say on the morrow? No, I must have misheard him through the laugh track. <laughs> Holy cow. He was throwing down some major juju, wasn't he? <laughs> Get ready for some major juju. Wow. Like em- em- Emmanuel Kant as a youth. Just Holy up. cow. A job not only, I, I'm not sure what he really said there. Let's be frank. I've heard this thing like 18 times and I have no idea what the point was he was making. But a job not only gives you money from your toil, from your toil, but it also you harvesting something in there too. <laughs> Weren't we harvesting at some point? Well, no, you harvest money from your toil. Yes. That is. Yes. That's my phrase of the week now. You also get the good feeling. You get the good feeling that you did something that helped. So if you're not doing a job that you like, this is what he's saying. You're not doing a job. Yeah. That do you, you want to like. wake up and. Hate yourself, but get paid or do something that you like on the morrow. <laughs> As we always say, <laughs> great stuff from, uh, from TikTok again. I think that was brilliant. I think we got to put that one in the, in the absolutely brilliant column. Candy Valentino's upstairs talking to mom, getting ready to come down to the basement. She has some raw life lessons that'll help anybody recession proof themselves with some no BS truths. Learn from the trenches. She built her first multi-million dollar business before she turned 21. Of course, she's been named a top business leaders, 40 under 40, top 50 women in business, 10 people making a difference. She, along with Tony Robbins and Brene Brown, were also called by Success Magazine leaders who get results. She shares her gritty real world business and investing strategies with an audience of millions through her founders organization. But you know what? She's sharing it here today. On the Stacky Benjamin Show. We're going to talk building wealth here in a moment. But Doug, we're going to talk about building some trivia first, huh? Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And on this day in the year 1412, the Medici family was appointed official banker of the papacy. Wait, is it papacy? 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 Papacy, I think. Because I know someone's paying with all the Vatican marble out there. But how much are they paying? 
Well, the Vatican finances have been shrouded in more secrecy than Joe's mom's TJ Maxx credit card bill. Am I right? According to Investopedia, the Holy See, which is the governing body of the Vatican, invests its money in Italian industries. Its funds are spread among stocks and bonds, but it limits its stake in companies. So my question is, what cap percentage does the Vatican put on its stake in Italian companies? Is it 6%, 16%, or 60%? I'll be back right after I go try on this funny hat. Hey there, stackers. I'm Toil Harvester and holy bother, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. As you might have guessed, the papacy invests conservatively, though actually, they shouldn't be that risk averse. I mean, they have like eternity to make it up, but they buy and hold proven companies in known industries, and they will not invest in companies that go against their values. So don't expect to see them at the Stacking Benjamins shareholder picnic anytime soon. So what percentage does the Vatican limit their company's stake to? Just 6%. I would have thought 7 And now, to help you with your own investment strategy that will last generations, Candy Valentino. And here she is having a seat at the card table. Candy Valentino's here. How are you? Hey, Joe. I'm great. How are you? Good. You know, I was wondering, you've been an entrepreneur forever and here we are early in the new year. Do you set new year's resolutions? I don't. (laughs) I don't set new year's resolutions, but I obviously set yearly, quarterly, monthly, and even decade long goals. So call them what you want, but I believe the resolution game is a little overused Um, There's actually a thing that we're approaching really soon. It's called Quitter's Day, where everyone quits their resolutions. Because what it is, is it's something, it's a moment in time they try to have their hat on to do, but they don't change or develop the habits in order to actually get there. So now 25 years in business, building wealth, I just have the habits. So I just set new goals of what I want to do next. Yeah. How often do you look at those? Is it a weekly thing, a monthly thing? So it depends on which one we're talking about. Like I typically have either decade, three-year, five-year goals, somewhere visually just for me to kind of see like big picture. And those can change from time to time. And then my monthly goals, I'm really addressing them, at least peeking at them daily. So it's just kind of if it's a money goal, if it's a certain number of doors for real estate investing, if depending on what it is, health goal. And then I'm measuring what matters in relation to that, at least on a weekly basis. So if it's it's if it's in my business, I'm monitoring, say, sales and revenues or certain KPIs. If it's health goals, I'm finding out what I put in my body and I'm making sure that I review it and see, uh, should I have done that or not this? Did I get to the gym? Did I run? Did I do that? So I think that it has to be top of mind so that it becomes just part of our everyday. Like we don't have to think about brushing our teeth. We don't have to think about driving to our favorite coffee shop. Like we just automatically do it. And I believe that when you want to truly create a successful, a rich, a wealthy life, you have to have that automated too. I love this idea though, of visual. It's funny. Tony Robbins is a mentor of yours and he talks about the power of visual. And I don't know the number of successful people that talk about, they keep that in front of them visually. There's something yeah. there. There's definitely a truth there, Candy, I believe that we all need to know. It's a science. I mean, oftentimes people think we hear manifestation and believe me, social media has certainly made it so fluffy. Like we just sit on the couch and decide we want something, but there's no action behind it to get there and it comes to you. Now that doesn't work. (laughs) But what I can tell you visually, it's just the way that our brains are wired. The reticulating activating system in our brain is a real thing. So when we have something visual that we're constantly seeing, constantly looking at, then it just helps us kind of pick that up in our environment. It helps us develop relationships that help us get there. I mean, I always say my journey of starting when I was 19 with no college degree, no corporate background, no rich parents, no educated parents. A lot of that was just visualizing what I wanted, reverse engineering that outcome, and then being courageous enough to just figure it out as I went along. I'm glad you brought up starting at 19 because that's really where I wanted to start How did you do it? I mean, starting a business at 19 years old, what made Candy Valentino go, you know what? I think I'm going to start this business. (laughs) Yeah, well... 
interestingly enough, like I said, neither my my dad was uh, 19. My mom was 16 when they found out they were going to have me. I grew up on government assistance in a trailer in a really small rural town. But one thing I did do that was very unique was I got dropped off at my dad's small business. He had an auto mechanic shop. He was self-employed my whole life. And so by the time I was five, eight, 11 years old, I was running the office. I was answering phones. I was working with customers. So rather than learning dance or a sport, I kind of learned that whole business environment. And so for me, when I wanted to go to college, because I thought I'll be the first one to go to college, this will be so cool. And I was in my first business class and I was listening to this business professor. And after the class, I said, oh, you know what? What business did you have? I was so excited to hear like what his revenue was and and what he started and his founder, what he founded. Right. And he goes, oh, I, I don't I don't have a business. I teach here. And I went, oh, well, did you have a business before? He goes, no, no, I went to school for business and I teach here. And something about my 18-year-old brain could not reconcile the fact that you're teaching me about business, but you yourself have never built one, even though I just spent the last 13 years of my life inside of one. So that was the switch. Something about my 54-year-old brain still doesn't get that. (laughs) Right? Yeah. So that was the switch for me. I was like, okay, forget it. Like, I'm just going to go do this on my own. I'm just going to figure it out. And so I just took the steps. Like, what do you need to do? I get an SBA loan. You know, I don't have any money. So get an SBA loan. I had a six week run rate, 45 days. I had seven employees when I started and I just tried to find a business model that didn't need, I didn't need a college degree for, I didn't need to have like a big fancy education or a lot of connections, something that was recession proof that had stood the test of time. But then I I spun it with a little bit of innovation because I had heard a quote that said, you either innovate or you market better than the innovator. And so I was like, well, I can't innovate much, but I know that I can market something better. And that that was the path that I chose. So I started wellness spas before they were kind of a thing on the East Coast. That's wild. And how how quickly did you go from one spa to two spas to... Oh my gosh. So, so there is a big, long journey through that instead of just doing the locations, which I was focused on and really doing franchising. I also realized that there was, you know, a brand within a business that I could build. So I started developing my own products rather than buying products from someone and selling them with only a 50% margin. I was like, how can I buy these, make them myself and make 400%? Because what I learned early on was in that industry, our profit margin on, on average was only 9%. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have to do so much revenue in order to make any money. So I need to get smart about business and numbers. And so it was really between there till I was about 23 was when I started really understanding it, really growing, hit all of my revenue goals that I was after. And then realize that you've got to always be stretching because otherwise you're the you're the lid, right? Like you have to be growing. You have to be having conversations, listening to podcasts like this, reading books, really self-educating so that you can expand your reality of the world in order to really grow and develop beyond what your current circumstance or your environment is. But even if you work for the man, I think there's the quote, the man. There's, there's so much that you said that I think we need to pay attention to, like knowing the key statistics to get where you want to go feels like another truth here, right? Knowing which things matter, which things don't a 9%, 9% profit margin matters. Having 16 stores that are all not profitable doesn't matter. Yeah. And it's that kind of stuff that people want to get you know, they focus so much on all of these different tactics and business, but really business and and, and personal finance at its core is so simple. We either increase revenue or we decrease expenses. Like it's either, it's not always what you make, it's what you keep, you know? And so if someone's working for someone else or in another job, it's not even about the paycheck that you make. It's what you do with your paycheck that matters. How many assets you're 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 creating? You know what your cash flow is off of those assets. Not just spending to look rich, but actually investing to be wealthy. And so those are some of the core things I learned really early, just by reading books. And you know we didn't have podcasts and social media in the late right. '90s, so it was books. <laughs> that was about it. <laughs> Infomercials, maybe. <laughs> 
I want to go back to you at five, seven, nine, eleven. You write in the book, Candy, that people said they felt sorry for you. Yeah. But you wrote that you didn't feel sorry for yourself. You had a blast with your what strawberry shortcake uh, yeah. bike with the banana seat and watching a little bit of TV and maybe going over and refilling the pop machine. Like this sitting on the sideline of an entrepreneurism to you was really, it sounds like fun, but, but in truth, your dad, your dad lost his job. He was down to how much money is last 200 bucks. Do I have that right? Yeah, you got right. Last yeah. 200 bucks, hands it to this woman who wants $400 for one month's rent and says, can I work it off? Like, it feels like you learned hustle from an early age. Yeah, I definitely did. And I still bring that into everything that I do. And unfortunately, society has made hustle a bad word. I totally disagree. I think hard work, ethic, work ethic, hustle is what everyone needs. Unless you come from some epicuric childhood that you understand all these things and can come out of college with an amazing job and career or company. But for me, hustle was something I could control. My effort was something that I could control. And I think that that's something everyone can control. It's like we we can't control the environment we were raised in. We can't control the circumstances or the decisions that got us to this point. But we get to decide what's next and what our next action is. And that's where true, true empowerment comes from. And so for me growing up, you know, I learned how to drive a car when I was seven so that I could back <laughs> up the cars in my dad's garage, like be able to move vehicles around for him and um, there was a car that had a beat up ball bearing, which makes a loud tapping like tat, 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 when you yeah. drive. <laughs> yeah. And I had this little Mazda with a bad ball bearing and I would drive it all around and I thought I was the coolest thing. But, you know, people would often say to your point, like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you come here every day. But it was all I knew. And so to me, still to this day, like work is fun. Now, not all the crap that we have to deal with being a founder or an entrepreneur is always fun. I think that's a bunch of BS that we're going to love what we do every day. But if you love the game, if you love business, if you love, you know, the data of business and really get involved in numbers and remove your emotion from it, that's what I see people do wrong is they, they attach themselves, their worth, their ego to money. And really money is just a result of effort. It's not a result of you. It doesn't define who you are. It just shows you whether you're on the right path or you need to switch your strategy or you need to implement and execute a little bit harder. I love how that just operates as a game. And that's truly what it is to me. And so it's always been, it's always been a blast and something that I enjoy. The piece of hustle culture that I don't like is the idea of just creating wealth. As I flip through your book and as I'm diving into the chapters of your book, I realize that you're not truly, your book's called Wealth Habits, Candy, but you're not even after wealth. Like wealth is not what you're after. You write that wealth is just a precursor to what you're truly after. And I, you know, the name of our show is Stacking Benjamins and I always get frustrated with people go, well, how don't you, why aren't you telling me how to just get rich quicker? Mm. But it's not really about that. Tell me really for you what the end game is around your hustle. Yeah. So how I always delineate it is it's not about making money. People try to accumulate money because they're trying to fill something within themselves. They're trying to feel significant. They're trying to have certainty. They're trying to control. They're, it's that ego at play. Maybe they felt at one point not worthy. To me, it's not making a bunch of money. To me, creating wealth is really freedom. It's creating a rich life. It's being able to gift what you want, donate what you want, contribute what you want, because we all know the stories of the people that were rich as far as a balance sheet or rich in their net worth, but they had a bankrupt life. They had a bankrupt relationship. They weren't happy. And they're the ones that we hear about that, that kill themselves or, you know, do horrific things because money will never be enough if that's all you're after. But creating a rich life is, is truly what I realized when I was 23 and I had had all the goals, right? All the things that I set out to do. I wrote my first set of goals after I listened to a Tony Robbins infomercial when I was 15. It was like the first time I had heard about like goal setting and all this stuff. And so I sat in my high school cafeteria like a nerd and wrote these goals out and started the company at 19 and then had them all by the time I was 23. And when I had bought, I was buying commercial real estate. When I bought this one building, and I know I've told people probably heard this story over and over, but I saw this one building and was like, what am I going to do with it? 
And it was like the realization in that moment at 25 years old that I had accomplished everything I sought out to do, that I was making more money than anyone I knew at that time, that I had had all the things, but I still felt like something was missing. Oh, yeah. And I think oftentimes people don't feel that at 25. They feel it at 45 or 55 or 65. And they forget that like that one thing that you think you're after, it isn't money. It's creating the rich life that I think we all crave where we're fulfilled. And and not only just my life, but in all the research for the book, the only way that you can do that is to contribute to something beyond you. If you're always looking at what you can get out of life and you're not looking at what you can bring to life, you will eventually at some point get to the end of yours and look back and see, what did I miss? Why do I feel like this? I just feel so grateful that I felt that at a young age because it totally put me on a different trajectory of giving. And that's why the last habit in the book talks all about giving. And I want to talk about that too, because I was so happy to see that. That, that giving is such a big part and having the service mentality has become such a big part of my life. But to your point, I had to learn that when I was much older, well, like to truly to get that message at 23, 24, like, is this it? Is this, is this, you know, I think about that old movie, Wall Street and Charlie Sheen saying to Michael Douglas, like, how many yachts can you water ski behind? Like, that is truly, is this what it's about? Mm -hmm. Uh, Some people don't even know what the hell I'm talking about. (laughs) Like Maybe that reference is too old, but I want to get back to you and, and learning from an early age about entrepreneurship. And I'm going to quote you from the book. You write even more important than some of the business specifics I learned, such as customer service and office management. By the way, how great candy to learn those at a young age. Cause I feel like these quote soft skills that you learn about dealing with people and dealing with customers are some of the most important skills any business owner or, or frankly, anybody working in any job should have. Yes. <laughs> what was the psychology I learned? I saw how my father managed the ups and downs of the business. I saw he had to swallow his fears. And sometimes, by the way, and I'm going to add this in, his pride, it sounded like, and keep going. I learned about determination and persistence. I learned about the mindset of providing quality service to customers and taking care of people, even when it wasn't convenient for yourself. I thought that was pretty powerful. So you tie all of this in your second, your second habit is about learning your way to wealth. And I'm going to dive in a little bit to learning it because clearly you're learning at age five, you're learning at seven, you're learning at eight. Let's be clear. And I think we already made this clear when you talked about your business professor, you're not talking about a college education, are you? No. I have no college education. I think I lasted about 12 weeks in college before I had that conversation. I don't even know if any of the credits qualified. So no, no, no college education whatsoever. So I'm literally self-taught, which is why I feel it's important for people to understand that that's something you can do too. Like you can learn your way into an industry, learn your way into wealth, into having that fulfilled life, into not trading time for money, you know, and you had mentioned about um, those soft skills in business, like no matter what industry you're in right now, whether you work for yourself or for someone else, it doesn't matter the industry. What you're in is the people business. And I learned that really early. And that was something that I drove into all of my employees and all the companies I've created is it doesn't, we're not in the spa industry. We're not in the jewelry industry. We're not in the service industry. We're not in the product industry. We're in the people industry. Because we're touching real people and having impact in real lives. And even when I had my last exit in 2019 and I came into this space, it was like, how can I serve? Who can I show up for? And when you come from that place, that's when work, even when it's optional, becomes fun again because you're you're focusing on the person that you can help. In true transparency, I didn't even want to write a book. Like it was something that had toyed around in my mind for a long time, but it was one conversation that led to like one direct publisher pitching me. Like, like, so it wasn't even something that I had an agent and sought out to do because it's a very personal thing, like putting all of that in there. Like my dad was a mechanic. My mom cleaned houses. I saw how people treated them sometimes, you know, being a a less than, and I'm using quotes if you're not visually seeing this type of profession. Like I saw how people treated them and how my dad did have to swallow his pride and had to figure it out and still had to show up. And so it taught me so much about people and how to really appreciate when someone pays you for something, like they're taking their money that they just worked for, that they left their family to go do 
to then give you for a product or service. And if you don't take that seriously, it's like disrespecting that person and what they do. And so I feel that every single business, every industry, every company that I'm in, and I really do my best to teach my team's that. And that's not something that comes from a college education. That's something that comes from life experience. You talk about, though, creating your own education and you have four different areas. Read, uh, reading quality books, uh, listening to TED Talks, audiobooks, lectures, podcasts, learn, build your skills by attending specific training programs, seminars and courses, model, find experts in the area where you're trying to become an expert. I want to ask you a little bit about modeling because you talk about how you're somebody who so you're 19 years old. You don't have access, right? You don't have access to these people. Now we have things like masterclass now where you can go out and yeah. learn from some of the greatest minds, but you are, have gone from a person that didn't have access to now somebody that does. I'm assuming you had to create that access. What was the tactic do you use to create access to some of these mentors that you now have in your life? Mm, so you're, you're not going to love now. I don't think I've ever been asked this question, by the way, but I don't think you're going to like the answer. <laughs> so <laughs> I see coming into this space, how people do that, right? They try to get in the room and they try to get around this person and they try to have the conversation. And to me, that feels very take that feels very selfish. It feels all about the person and what they can get and how they can up level their life. And it's not an equal energy exchange. I have never come from that place. Number one, I built success first. I didn't try to get into the room to have success. So totally different energy. And then I had no problem paying for it because I valued their opinions. I valued their time. And so it came from a different place of like, I'm not going to try to ask you to come speak at my event. What's your speaking fee? And I will gladly pay it because you're worth it. And when you come from that energy and you come from that intention and then the person meets you and they're like, whoa, like this is the real deal. Like she's actually built stuff. She's actually done stuff. Then they welcome you with open arms into your world. And so it's a different energy exchange. It's what can I give? It's who can I connect with, but in a, in a very natural, organic way, not in a strategy or a tactic. I want to ask you one more question on, on learning that uh, surprised me, frankly. You say that one of the mistakes you see people make is that they focus on education as a whole. What does that mean? What are, you, what are you talking about? We get too tactical with our education? So I see society talking about education. Go get an education. And really what they mean is go get a college degree. They're not actually meaning to specialize in one specific niche, industry, skill, or trade, that you're going to get a direct ROI on your time. So what happens is, again, society, and this is nothing against anybody with college educations. I have tons of friends, more friends that are educated than not. But, you know, obviously this isn't a knock on them. It's just a different way of thinking. And it's just thinking that not everyone needs to be self-educated and not everybody needs to go to college, although society tells us everybody should go get an education. So it's a little more of a holistic approach where instead of just saying, go get a degree, and how many people do you know that got a degree and they don't even use that degree in that industry for what they actually make money in? What if you took those four years and instead of getting 85 thousand dollars a year for a school loan, which is what the industry average was when I actually did the research for the book last year. What if you actually instead got $10,000 and started a business? Or what if you went and tried to learn a trade or a skill? You know, I know so many people that are in the HVAC and electrical space that make bank and they yeah. don't have a four year or six year degree. And yet there's people with a master's degree that take an entry level job because they can't find something in their field because they didn't do the research ahead of time to see if it was a viable skill in the current economy. So the way I view education is getting a direct ROI on the time and money that I invest in it. What can I learn that will produce a result that I can then either plug into my business or that I can develop service or a product from in order to deliver it. And that's how you make more earlier in your life so that you can invest sooner. And then compound interest will give you more millions when you come to retirement age. Man, and I love in your book that, that you know, don't just get tactical about what do I need and then I'm going to apply so I can use it and then I remember it. But then also, also think a little bit, I hate the term outside the box, but, 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 but think a little bit outside, like who can teach me this that's not the standard person? Like how can I expand upon this idea so that I can maybe bring something new to the thing that I'm 
thinking about. I thought that was important. I only have 67 more questions left. Uh, but the <laughs> one that's really important I want to ask before we go, I actually want to talk about the end of the book after this, but I want to talk about the saw tax because if people are working the way through your six habits, I think this is a really important concept to understand. Candy, what's the saw tax? Uh, it's such a good one. It is the tax that everyone pays when they either are successful, they're achieving, or they're wealthy. And this is the tax that it just happens because when you want to go out there and you want to go for success, even if you're not successful yet, or you want to start achieving, even if you haven't yet, or you want to start to create wealth, there are going to be people that tell you you can't, tell you you shouldn't, tell you why you don't want those things or why you shouldn't want those things. And it's going to come with criticism, judgment, and possibly even some hate. That is the tax you pay to go after your dreams. And I can tell you that if you value what you want out of life more than the criticism and the opinions of others, you will be able to create more than you can ever imagine. Starting out as a female founder at 19, like in the late 90s, guys, like this wasn't a thing. There was no <laughs> boss babe. There was no girl empowerment. Like, I mean, I remember I even say, how back easy then. was that, Candy? Tell us how easy oh, that was. Oh Just gosh. super easy. <laughs> Like, and then being 21, like trying to invest in real estate and people are like, oh, where's your husband? You know? And I'm like, I don't have one. <laughs> like, I mean, it's just like the craziest thing. And, and it, we've come a long way in 20 years, 25 years, but we also need a little ways to go. I mean, it wasn't that long ago I was in a dealership and they literally were talking to my boyfriend the entire time and not You're kidding me. me. And I was like, hi, like I'm going to be writing a check for the car. You might want to talk to me about the what it does. So that still happens nowhere near as much. But I think it's just important to remember that if you decide, like you listen to this podcast, you hear Joe talk all the time, like you want to go create this life for yourself. It's, it's not so much anybody's fault. Like the people around us want sameness. They like you or they're getting something from you or you feel a need in their life in some way. So they want you to stay the same, even if they, it's not intentionally malicious. So oftentimes when you go to evolve and you go to change, people see that difference in you and you could just very well be triggering lack in them because it's a heck of a lot easier for them to talk about you or judge you than it is for them to go change their own life, which it's available for them too. So I think if we understand the psychology of pe why people do it, then we don't get emotionally hurt or attached to their feelings. And then we understand that the saw tax is just something there that has to be paid just like to the IRS. It's almost, you just, you got to roll your eyes and go with it. Just, yep. This is, this is a direct result. Actually, after reading your book, I think people should kind of feel good that you're getting the hate. You're like, okay, this means I'm That's actually right. making a mark. This means, yeah. yeah. When did the giving button, you know, your last wealth habit is about giving your way to wealth. When did you get the giving aha? As I mentioned earlier, Candy, it took me a while. And when I did, I'm like, why the hell didn't I realize this earlier? Like the more I give, the more, the wealthier I am by far. Like, it's not about me giving to other people. It's about, I have this huge wealth because of the giving thing. Like, when did you get that aha? I remember probably being six, seven years old and going to Hills department stores, which were out on the East coast. And I remember there was these Christmas trees with these little handwritten ornaments on them that you could take off. And on the back would be a child's name, age, and gender. And you could get a toy for the kid. And I remember wanting to get a toy. Didn't know who these kids were, but I knew what it was like to not have. And so I thought if I could take one of my Christmas gifts and give one of these kids one of my Christmas gifts, that that maybe that would make their Christmas a little brighter too. At six. At six. Yeah, six or seven. So it became a yearly tradition then. And as my dad started to be more successful and have a little more money, then each of us took, there was the, you know, I'm an only child. So each of us took a, a kid. And I remember getting the photos. Every once in a while, you would get a Polaroid, like literally a Polaroid of the kid holding the toy and just their faces and how happy they were. And I remember that feeling of how happy that made me. And so fast forward a little bit older when I had my first like business and I was working with my dad and I was reselling golf balls to, for a whole other podcast, but I was cleaning up <laughs> golf balls and reselling them back to the golfers where our trailer was parked on this golf course, like near it. So I, you know, had some money and I was starting to get these things in the mail from like different charities. And so I would 
send $5 in this envelope and $5 in that envelope. And I remember my dad seeing me do it. And he said, you're going to give all your money away if you keep doing that. And I didn't listen. I kept doing it. And then it was, you know, interesting at 25 when I had had all of those goals and I had that empty building sitting there and I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I remember thinking like, what am I going to do with that building? And it was like that instinct happens that I think we all get. Like, I don't think we get it later. I think it happens earlier, but I think we ignore it because we're so focused mentally or logically on what we want that we kind of don't hear those little nudges or hear that little guiding voice. And I think because of being a child from an abusive situation as a, you know, I've always kind of had to listen to that voice because that was my guiding light. That was what told me what to do. And so it was clear as day, 25 basically told me to donate that building to charity and start a nonprofit. And lot, I mean, I wasn't a multi, multi million, you know, I didn't have like, it wasn't like that. Like I wasn't like Elon at a young age. Like I was just doing well, <laughs> like better than I thought, you know, I would be doing from my, my beginnings. And I was just like, okay, yeah, yes, yes. Like it was just unequivocally yes. And rather than questioning it, cause this is what I think happens with people. I think we get the instinct, we get the nudge, we hear that we're supposed to do something. And then within one half of one second, our brain kicks in and starts to talk about all the reasons why we shouldn't, why we can't, why that doesn't make sense. Well, our, brain than just says, our brain says what your dad said to you, you're going to give away all your money. Meanwhile, no one ever goes broke by giving money away. They go broke by spending it. They go broke by investing in some get rich quick scheme. Nobody goes broke by giving it away. And so when I heard that, I just was like, yes, I'm going to start a nonprofit. So at 26, I founded a nonprofit. I actually had four additional locations at that time. I was working with a franchising attorney and I knew I can either do this or I could do this nonprofit. And it was one of the hardest decisions. And probably from a business standpoint, people would looking back, that probably cost me about a 10x multiple on one of my exits. But it was the best decision I ever made because it didn't just help the community. It didn't just give back. It actually healed me, which is why the name is Heal Animal Rescue. It actually healed me in such a big way. And it taught me a lot about life. And I think that we're all giving those opportunities, but we just rationalize our way out of them. We think our way out of them. So I just always encourage people that when you get that gut instinct, when you get pulled to something, when something breaks your heart, don't shy away from it walk towards it because there may be truly something more purposeful for you in it or some healing for you in it or life lessons that you need to learn. You dedicate your book to rescue dogs. And I think we've seen your buddy in the background a couple minutes, yes. a couple of times here. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hanging out with yeah. us. The book is called Wealth Habits, Six Ordinary Steps to Achieve Extraordinary Financial Freedom. As you can already tell from talking to Candy. It's incredibly extraordinary. I don't think there's anything ordinary about this. There's a lot of aha uh -huh in a short period of time in this book. And it's available everywhere and coming out on audiobook. You told me before we hit record. Yes, and all proceeds go to charity. So I'm not making a dime from it. We're donating all the proceeds again, just as our way to give back. And so you can get it anywhere. Audiobook will be out on Audible, Audible I think the end of January. So depending on when you're listening, um, you can grab that too. Thanks for hanging out with us and helping stackers everywhere become wealthier and meaning that in a getting more freedom kind of way. Thanks so much, Candy. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Hey, I'm Rob Berger. When I'm not rolling in the dough, that's right. I'm stacking Benjamins. Let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, OG, they put what you value first. I value being able to take a break in the middle of my vacation travel to the basement, hang out with you guys, get this goodness out into the universe, and be back <laughs> sipping Mai Tais and eating grilled octopus by lunch. Grilled <laughs> octopus. That's the life. I don't know which part of that's the life. Is the life hanging out with us or is the life uh, eating grilled octopus? Probably more hanging out with us. Yes. Yeah. It's your loved ones in your time, which... I know we're your loved ones, OG, and thank you for taking time with us. You're welcome. And that's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Head to stackybenjamins.com slash havenlife now for a free quote. Their application is simple. It's online. You'll get an instant coverage decision 
Prices are affordable. All policies issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual, more than 160 year old insurer. Let's throw out Haven Lifeline to our new friend, Nick. Say hi, Nick. Hey, this is Nick from the Southwest, longtime listener. Just for Joe to start off, the word or buzzword, Coast Fi. Hopefully that gets you uh, in a good mood for the rest of this recording. My question is this I'm currently active duty and currently plan on separating the next couple of years and taking a roughly 40% pay cut. Currently on my active duty pay, I have a savings rate of about 40%, just small humble brag there. And with that pay cut, that will basically be everything that we are saving. Would you recommend, or at least what we are considering, is trying to save as much as we can in our taxable account right now with that 40%. When we take that pay cut, should we start to utilize that amount in the taxable account and move it into a retirement account. I know dollars are fungible, but how smart is this considering market volatility and all of that fun stuff? Thank you very much. And in the spirit of Christmas, please send me a large T-shirt and show uh, Doug before you send it on its way. Just to remind him that he hasn't earned one yet. Thanks. He's, he spreads the salt. He spreads the salt around the entire Who is show. This guy? Wow. We should have listened to that one first, Nick. How do we let him in the Nick basement? spreads it around. Good deal being coast fi there, buddy. Good, good deal. So, so good. And for new, new listeners, uh, I'm just not a fan of these little buzzwords that we've created that it's like a tiny quartile of our, uh, of so our, he, he managed to piss off everybody except OG in that call. I know. Right. Nice work, Nick. Well, look at OG shrug his shoulders. Well, you know, hey, you know, when you got it, yes. So, uh, so what do you think about Nick's uh, fungible money strategy? I'm trying to figure out what he was talking about. So he's saying I'm putting all this money in my brokerage account now, and then when I do quit my military job, I'm going to move it into retirement accounts from that point forward. If I maybe don't need it, yeah, I'm not sure how that works. I mean, the only way to put money into retirement accounts is if you have earned income. So if you're going to retire, so, you know, you're a military active duty and, and you're taking a pension, that's not earned income. That's, that's retirement income or disability income, depending. So you won't be able to just arbitrarily put money into a 401k or put money into an IRA unless you have earned income on top of that. So I'm not sure what you mean by, Hey, let's just, you know, move it into the accounts later. I would do it now. I don't know why you wouldn't use your TSP or uh, Roth IRAs today because it gives you all the tax benefits, allows you to be able to save a little bit more if you're using pre-tax, certainly keeps that money tax deferred while it's sitting there. And if your income is going to basically look the same, right? So right now you make $100,000, but you save 40 and you live on 60. I'm making these numbers up. And then when you retire, you're going to just make 60 and not have any savings, at least for a little bit of time before you do whatever it is you're going to do. I don't know why you wouldn't just put it in retirement accounts now. Put it in now. Yeah. I mean, you need some flexibility for sure. So maybe a little bit. It seems far more straightforward. I feel like though there might be a, I don't know, Nick, there might be a part of that uh, question that you may have missed based on our, based on our response. Well, the biggest thing is, is that you can't pile up a whole bunch of money in a brokerage account and then go, now I want this all to be retirement. Right. The best you could do would be move it over in $6,500 increments in your Roth or $6,500 in your spouse's Roth too. So you get 13000 a year. But even so, you need to have some earned income to be able to do that. So maybe you're just going to look at it and say, well, so I don't have to save money. I'm going to take it from my investment account and move it over to retirement. But it just seems like a lot of extra steps. So do it now. Thanks for the question, Nick. And, uh, uh, Doug, you want to take a look at uh, Nick's T-shirt before we send before we send it out to him? Oh, I definitely want to see that T-shirt. I might add some extra graphics to it. It's so so bad. Uh, StackyBenjamins dot com slash voicemail. If you want to be like a kinder, gentler version of Nick, and call into the basement and get OG's answer to your question. That's going to do it for today. Hey, uh, a lot going on this week in the basement. I will be over on Instagram Live on Wednesday of this week. 5 p.m. Eastern is when I'll be over there. So make sure and come and say hi and uh, hang out with us. We'll be talking to, be talking to. well, I don't know exactly who will be there this week with me, but 
it's always fun over chatting with all of you on Instagram on Wednesday afternoons. We have a full slate of different places where you can go get more resources. You'll find those in our welcome guide, stackingbenjamins.com slash welcome. That includes the 201, our free newsletter, stackingbenjamins.com slash 201, where we go deeper into all these topics. Kevin Bailey from our team has curated links so that you can go into even more depth. If you need a new job, you're looking at building wealth. Geez, what else we talked today? We talked about uh, the morrow. If you need to know what to do on the morrow, Kevin's got you covered over there. StackyBenjamins.com slash 201. But if you're not here for a newsletter or to hang out in Instagram, you're concerned about the market and all this chatter about recessions. OG and his team have put together a free guide that shares eight moves to make in a down market. A guide to help you plan more and panic less no matter what the market does. So head over to StackyBenjamins.com slash guide. That's stackybenjamins.com slash guide and get this free helpful guide from OG. All right. That's going to do it for today. We'll see you back here on Wednesday. We have one of our top fives coming on Wednesday. Can't wait for that. But for now, I can't wait to hear from Doug. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first, take some advice from Candy Valentino. Building wealth isn't about the hot stock of the month or earning your way to riches. Build a foundation and focus on the fundamentals, and you will build a world of wealth for yourself. Second, thinking about quitting your job? Have that resume up to date and be sharp on the interview. It's about to get a lot more competitive. But the big lesson? I should have been a Medici. I could have been Pope by now. Wait a minute. Aren't they supposed to be celibate? (laughs) Never mind. Thanks to Candy Valentino for joining us today. Find out more about what she's got going on at CandyValentino.com. We'll also include links in our show notes where you got it at StackingBenjamins.com. This show is the property of SP Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Take a deeper dive into all the topics we cover on each episode by checking out our newsletter, The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. And once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I was taking my Christmas tree down yesterday and uh so did we. Well, and and you know it makes me sad. It really does. I I love the Christmas tree up. I think we should just leave it up all year long. Do you know what though? If you think about it, when do you put yours up? Well, this year because I did the Christmas well, markets yeah. thing, I put Be- it up really early. But usually just after Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving weekend. Okay, so we're a little earlier on the Christmas spirit because 
when we do our Christmas lights, we like to do them while it's still tolerably nice outside. And as you get yeah. toward late November, it could be, you know, really windy and cold. So we put up the Christmas lights November 2nd. Now, before everybody ats me, we don't turn them on on November 2nd, but they're there. And so you're getting this stuff out. And so usually by about the 15th, we're starting to starting to dabble in the Christmas spirit, the, fi- the 15th of November, which might include the tree. This year, we didn't do the tree till Thanksgiving also, which felt a little later for us. But that's still the better part of like, you know, a sixth of the year. You know, you've got Christmas going on. So, yeah, but you know anyway. what the point is? Is that so many people... Jesus. Oh, 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 of, of the whole Christmas thing. Oh, gotcha. The, uh, (laughs) couldn't trick me. The thing that really frustrates me is that back when, back when I lived in Michigan, I always thought that in February I was getting kind of dark, get kind of down. And I always thought it was my birthday. I was pretty certain that I got the birthday blues and then we moved to Texas I moved to Texas and a lot less clouds here than there are in Detroit. It's sunny a fair amount of the time. The weather's warmer. So I go outside for walks in the winter. I feel a lot better and I don't get that blue season. And I think, I just think, okay, maybe take down the Christmas tree. Cause I get the whole Christmas tree thing, but these lights during the darkest months, man, especially when I was living in Michigan, I would have loved to have had those lights up all winter long. Just make it look nice, you know, make it look fun and festive during January and February the whole time, but we take it all down. And then when you go into January and I always affiliate January with like winter sludge, just that sludgy Brown snow that everybody drives through on their way to work and then back. It just seems like such a, such a pain. Um, We need the lights. We need the lights. OJ. I'm good with them being gone. I'm happy. I'm happy everything's back to normal. Oh, no, bad news. One star. One star. I give January one star. That uh, vitamin D thing's a real thing, though. It totally it's is. Really, You got to take your vitamin D pills. Don't forget to take I your f- vitamin D pills, people. I feel so much better here in January, even though, to your point, we still don't get enough. We still don't get enough sun. Well, you know what's funny, though, is that my brother turned me onto this uh, app, uh, and it measures the vitamin D that's being produced by the sun based on where you are, your latitude and longitude. He lives in Michigan and they will not get any amount of vitamin D from the sun until March. Oh, even if you were outside completely naked, you know, it was perfectly sunny. There's no quality of that sun. I don't know what the cutoff is. I'm sure there's somebody that does, but yeah, you need to be sucking down your vitamin D, Doug. You need to be getting some D 